Hi class, in this recording we are going to be covering our week two lab objective sheet and let's just dive into it. So as we look at bone classification, the first Roman numeral we have on your lab objective sheet, what I want you to get out of this uh, list of four categories is to be able to categorize the four bones. Um, of these four categories, we have long, short, flat, and irregular. In your lab manual and in the visible body assigned readings um, for the a &P app, those things are covered. Uh, we just want you to be able to look at an individual bone and say, hey, it's a short bone. Hey, it's a flat bone. Hey, it's a sh long bone. Know these uh, distinctions. As we look at long bones, generally speaking, I like to define them as a bone that is twice as long, at least twice as long as it is wide. A short bone in my, in my world is a bone that is about as long as it is wide. As we look at flat bones, flat bones are bones that have uh, plates on them, large plates. And then the irregular bones are the miscellaneous category. Uh, Roman numeral number two is in your lab manual. It's covered in table 8.1 in your lab manual. We will not, on your lab exam, ask you what's a trochanter, what's a, fu uh, what's a facet, what's a condyle. Instead, uh, if you learn these broad terms, these broad terms will help you to learn uh, the, the specific bony markings of specific bones. So while I'm never going to ask you what's a foramen, um, on this objective sheet, there are foramen magnum, foramen oval, infraorbital foramen. This, that term foramen gets used 15 total times on this lab objective sheet. Uh, so it's going to be used quite a bit, even though I'm never going to ask you, what is a foramen? If you know what a foramen is, you'll be better able to identify all those bony markings that use this term. Fontanelles it, were not included in your lab manual in the section on bones, uh, so we had to give you a special note. Go to page 134 of your lab manual. A fontanelle is a soft spot on the skull in between the bony plates of the skull. Oh, 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 sorry about that. Excuse me. Well sneak attack there with my yawns. Um, as we're looking at the gross anatomy of a typical long bone, we want you to be able to uh, know proximal versus distal diaphyses or, or epiphyses, what the diaphysis is, what the articular cartilage is, um, and then also some of the histology of the long bone as well. So we're going to go ahead and go to digital histology right now. And my mouse hopefully will start working for us. Here we go. So as we look at a long bone, this long bone is over twice as long as it is wide. And it can be broken up into the diaphysis, which is in the middle. Uh, as we look at the diaphysis here, I'll go ahead and draw on the diaphysis. It's going to be this region right here in the very middle of the bone. And then in red, we have our epiphyses. Uh, here is the proximal epiphyses. It's closer to the point of attachment. Uh, this is a humerus on the bottom of the screen, femur on the top. And then here's a distal epiphyses, farther away from the point of attachment, or down, farther away on the appendage, from the point of attachment of the appendage. And then to separate the epiphyses from the diaphyses, we have epiphyseal plates. These uh, epiphyseal plates, excuse me, epiphyseal lines are right here, um, and or epiphyseal plates. Um, as we look at the epiphyseal line versus the epiphyseal plate, um, that's just going to refer to uh, where the gro what we commonly refer to as the growth plate is. Um, as we look at the epiphyseal plate, that is going to be one that is not fully fused. Um, the has the epiphyseal line is when the growth has ceased. So the epiphyseal line is going to have hyaline cartilage on it, or excuse me, compact bone, whereas the epiphyseal plate, let me pull up the epiphyseal plate right here. The epiphyseal plate um, shown here and here. Uh, is where there is not fusion. Uh, instead, there will be hyaline cartilage at those locations. Uh, but moving on, 
uh, as we look at articular cartilages, car articular cartilages are just cartilages that are on the articulation points of the bone, uh, where the bone rubs against other bones within the joint. Um, as we are looking at the periosteum and endosteum, peri is a root word that means outer perimeter, endo meaning inside, and osti meaning bones. The periosteum is a lining on the outside of the bone. The endosteum is a lining on the inside of the bone. And we can see the periosteum here in this figure that I have pulled up. Um, the endosteum is going to line our bone cavity. So I'll switch to bright green, my preferred color. Here in bright green we have endosteum, lining cavities within the bone. But as we look at the periosteum, our periosteum is going to be a fibrous membrane along the outer edge of the bone. And the periosteum is broken up into two areas. We are going to have an osteogenic layer where we're actively making new bone. And then we're also going to have a fibrous layer that serves a protective function to help encapsulate the bone as an organ. We also have spongy bone and compact bone tissue. I'm going to go ahead and go to the histology guide sites because they're fantastic. So here we have some spongy bone tissue and there's really a lot going on in the slide. Uh, we have some skeletal bone, some muscular tissue or skeletal muscle tissue. Here uh, in the center, the circle, that's the cross section of a spinal cord. Over here is a blood vessel on the right, and then right here we can see some articular cartilage. Right there is the form of hyaline cartilage, which is just articular cartilage and hyaline articular cartilage is just hyaline cartilage in a joint. But we're going to focus on the spongy bone aspect of this slide. So I'm going to zoom back out some more. And then right here. Uh, is the spongy bone from an intervertebral body. And as we look at this spongy bone, we're going to have the network of these bright pink branches all combined together. I'm coloring them green right now. These bright pink branches all combine to form the spongy bone tissue. An individual bright pink branch is called a trabeculae. Um, and which is why we will sometimes see the term trabecular bone. Trabecular bone is made of the individual trabeculae, and it's a synonym for spongy bone. If we look at our lab objective sheet, both trabecular bone and spongy bone are accepted lab objectives. And in terms of how do I differentiate these, um, if we ask you for the name of a tissue, it's trabecular bone. If we ask you for the structure, it's trabeculae. Um, while I'm here, I want to point out the red bone marrow that's present in the spongy bone tissue. I'm jumping ahead a little bit on the lab objective sheet. But this tissue right here that is in between the trabeculae of the spongy bone or trabeculae of the trabecular bone, that's all red bone marrow. I'll go ahead and zoom in on that for us. So here we can see red bone marrow. And at this point, I just want you to realize that it's the, where we make our blood. Red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, or erythrocytes, leukocytes, and thrombocytes. We'll talk about red bone marrow in more detail in A&P2. Um, as we look at compact bone, Compact bone is also referred to as cortical bone. So as we look at this compact bone tissue, and there's multiple names out there. We're, for uh, this class, we're going to focus on cortical bone or compact bone. Uh, we can zoom in on our compact bone, and there's these large structures that are just very apparent. Oh, here's a good one. I like this one. Nice and textbook. So this series of concentric rings, this circular, stru large circular structure is referred to as the osteon. And this osteon is what makes up, uh, is the structural and functional unit of compact bone. Now this whole thing I circled in green is the osteon. In the center of our osteon, we have a hole that will have blood vessels and nerves traveling through it. I just circled that in red. It is referred to as the Habersian canal or the central canal. Habersian canal is an old school term. Central canal is the term that you used in your lab manual and that we put on your lab objective sheet. 
we're also going to have, as we look at this view here, some rings. And I'm going to go ahead and use blue here. Oh, oh, here we go. I'll use some blue to help highlight the rings that we can see. These dark spots represent um, boundaries in between the rings. So here we can see how there's a boundary right here, there's another boundary right here, so on and so forth. Each individual ring, these concentric rings that go all the way around the bone, or all the way around the osteon, these rings are all referred to as lamella. The root word there is, for lamella is layer. If you've ever seen laminated wood, or if you've ever seen something that's been laminated, when you laminate something, you take multiple layers of a material and you bind them together. And lamella are multiple layers of compact bone extracellular matrix bound together in these ring-like structures. So in blue, I have all the, I'm drawing individual lamella. Uh, let's shift to yellow here. In yellow, we had, I'm going to go ahead and circle one of these dark dots or these elongated shapes. I just circled both a space and a cell. The cell is called the osteocyte. The space is called the lacuna. So on the lab exam, if I put that pointer right there at those dark spots and I ask for the name of the cell, identify the cell, I want osteocyte. If I tell you to identify the space, I want to hear lacuna. For the space. And lacuna is a generic term that shows up uh, fairly frequently. Uh, the canal caniculus, singular, canal caniculi, plural, um, are going to be little tiny extensions that come off of the lacuna. So as we look at this space, we can see how there's, if this, uh, I'll go ahead and use yellow here to highlight the, the space, the lacuna, you'll see these little tiny black branches coming off of the space. Those little tiny extensions coming off of the lacuna, collectively, plural, are referred to as canal caniculi, or singular, a canal caniculus. Uh, and those serve to allow for the osteocyte that sits in the lacuna to better monitor stresses and pressures, which are uh, placed upon the compact bone tissue. Now as we look at red bone marrow versus yellow bone marrow, uh, actually the digital histology site, it's pretty fantastic here. It gives us a really straightforward left-right comparison. So on the left-hand side of the screen, we have yellow bone marrow. On the right-hand side of the screen, we have red bone marrow. Yellow bone marrow is mostly adipose tissue. Um, red bone marrow is go mostly going to be uh, precursor cells that we use to make our blood. Red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets. Uh, typically, the pattern is this, that when we are born and when we are in utero, so before we're born, we have lots and lots of red bone marrow. But as we age, red bone marrow is slowly infiltrated by fat cells, adipocytes. And eventually it'll look like this on the left-hand side of the screen where it'll be mostly fat filling our bones. Uh, human adults will still have some red bone marrow left at, during adulthood. We s still need to make blood as adults. That blood is typically, or the red bone marrow is typically going to be sun, um, concentrated within spongy bone tissue of our bodies. The marrow cavity or medullary cavity of long bones is notorious for starting out being completely filled with red bone marrow, but as we age, converting to yellow bone marrow. Let's go back to our lab objective sheet. Ooh, need to scooch that over. All right, and that's it for our first bit of our lab objective sheet. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to post them in the class discussion board. And as always, happy studies.